Let's keep reading McGrua and the Goat. We're just up to the part where McGrua turned pink. No one had anyone... That was the first time anyone had ever given him a present. He took it off. Oh, it was the hat, that's right. Admired it, then tucked it under his web, which was even better than a pocket for keeping things safe. It isn't that he doesn't like it, Captain Duff explained, but his head will get hot while he pulls the cart and he perspires easily. Mrs Dumpling looked astonished. I never thought of an octopus perspiring, with all those arms too. It's all right. You're upwind of him, Captain Duff assured her, and they all laughed so loudly that McElliot heard it across two mountain ranges and began to hurry. Heave ho, my hearty, Captain Duff said, and they set off. They caused quite a stir when they arrived in the marketplace. The locals flocked to buy Mrs Dumpling's apple pies, and they recognised Captain Duff with greetings which warmed his heart. But everyone kept their distance from McGrewer. He was just curling himself into a ball down the muzzle of the War Memorial Cannon, where he hoped small boys with sticks wouldn't be able to reach him, when Mrs Dumpling came to his rescue. She fancied herself now as something of an authority on octopuses, and she explained at large what a good job McGrewer had done on her chimney and how he was going into the family business as first assistant to Captain Duff. She called him to come out of the cannon, and he emerged shyly from the long black barrel in front of the crowd. He was his own best advertisement. Together with Captain Duff, he received more offers of jobs than there are weeks in the year. It was very pleasurable. It was a very pleasurable and profitable day for all. For the first time in his life, McGrewer was welcome in everyone's house and he felt thoroughly at home in the depths of the chimneys he visited. Captain Duff was at home too among people who had known him as a boy and he began to catch up on all that had happened in the valley while he had been sailing the seven seas. Mrs Dumpling was in her element among all the people in the market and her socks and gloves were as popular as ever. Tourists from across the world talked to her and promised to send postcards of castles on the Rhine, tulips in Holland, temples in Japan and skyscrapers in New York. She told Captain Duff about it on the way home. I even sold three pairs of socks to a mountaineer from Chile. Then he's not Sile, Captain Duff said. No Chile blames for him. Their laughter rang across the closest mountains and McElliot on the top on the other side put on an extra, extra spurt. When they, all, when they got home, Mrs Dumpling said to McGrewer, All that soot and sweat, why don't you take a bath? I'll light just a wee fire under the copper to take the chill off the water for you. McGrewer had soaked every tentacle and scrubbed every sucker and was just wallowing lazily in the warm water, curling and uncoiling, when there was a loud clatter outside. The door burst open and who should come, come in but McElliot. She was just about to gobble down a bucket full of apples when McGrewer squirted her with water. She skipped with surprise, looked around, oops, looked around, looked around the seemingly empty laundry and returned to the apples. McGrewer squirted harder the second time and knocked an apple from her mouth. She bleated with annoyance and bent down to pick it up. McGrewer squirted so hard the third time that McElliot was drenched. Then he submerged in the sooty water in the copper, which bubbled like a mud pool with his laughter. Geysers and billy ghosts, said McElliot. I'm getting out. McGrewer emerged from the copper and threw long, shiny arms across the floor. No, you're not, he said in a cavernous voice. McElliot jumped so high that she hit the roof. Coming down again, she recognised McGrewer and began to bleat. Oh, it's only you. What a fright you gave me. She stamped a foot and tossed her head. McGrewer laughed. I'm glad you deserved it. Then he became thoughtful. But it's the first time I ever have been glad. I don't mean to frighten people and I don't like it when I do. I'm a shy sort of fellow, really, and I'd much sooner make friends. Where have you been? he asked. Mrs Dumpling has been worried. I went with the winds, McElliot said. Where did they take you? McGrewer asked. Over the mountain and far away. What did you see? 
I saw the sea, McElliot said, blue and shining and stretching as far into the distance as the mountains reached to the sky. The octopus looked sad. It's deep too, he said. As deep as the mountains are high and all sorts of creatures live in it and plants grow in it. The goat looked at the octopus. You'd like to see it again, wouldn't you? McGrewer nodded. Then I'll take you, McElliot announced. It's a fair way to walk, and I wouldn't want to do it by myself again because of the trolls, but I'd like to hear them say, Who's that walking over my bridge? And I'd love to see their faces when you appear. She giggled. Oh, I don't mean because you're ugly, she hastened to add. Nobody can help their looks. She pirouetted, studying her dainty feet smugly. Then she noticed that McGrewer was going a dirty car key. I mean that you're more than a match for any troll. You're so smart. McGrewer went pink. Intelligence is a characteristic of the species, he said modest, modestly. He flexed his tentacles. There's no doubt I could turn the tables on any troll. I could make my own bridge. He swung two pairs of tentacles from one side of the room to the other with scarcely a contortion. Minced the other four across the instant bridge. Trip, trap, trip, trap, he warbled. McElliot couldn't stop giggling. Oh, McGrewer, you are so funny. The trolls would die laughing. A nice way to go, McGrewer commented solemnly and added, a, placeful dis a playful disposition has frequently been observed in octopuses in captivity. He shook himself back to his normal arrangement. Not that I'm in captivity, he added quickly. It's just that I'm the only company Captain Duff got. Captain Duff Scott. He'd miss me terribly if I went off tramping. Besides, we've just taken up the family business again, and there are... <clears throat> and there are enough chimneys to keep us busy every Friday for a year while Mrs. Dumpling... Friday, McElliot interrupted. That's market day. You mean... Oh no, she stamped. I'm just going to put my foot right down, and not in front of that horrible, humiliating cart either. And I'm never going to set them in that boring market square again, either. Why, what would I do? There's hardly a challenge left in the whole town. I could climb the cannon, but even the kids do that. I could eat the rope and bring down the flag. Not fully down. Half-mast would make it more interesting. I could, McGrewer said. No need to be worried about that horrible, humiliating cart, humiliating cart, as you call it. Of course, it does squeak a bit, I grant you, which draws unnecessary attention, but a well-placed drop of oil will soon fix that. I might have a, have a look at replacing the axle, too. That would make it run more smoothly. McElliot's eyes widened. You're quite an engineer, aren't you? The octopus has been observed to be both inquisitive and ingenious, McGrewer remarked. As for something to do, there's a lot of truth in the old proverb, many hands make light work. Mind you, I'm not saying Captain Duff doesn't play his part. He does. He chats up the clients. In fact, you might say he's the chatting partner. But I do the real work, and even I can't be in more than eight places at once. Now, if we were to take you into the partnership as the rooftop inspector, some of my problems would be immediately eliminated. I shall put it to Captain Duff as my recommendation. You mean I'd be officially allowed on people's roofs? Only on the roofs of clients, with their approval, of course, but I'm sure we'd have no problems there. He curled and uncurled his tentacles reflectively. McGrewer, Elliot exclaimed. If I could hug you, I would. McElliot, McGrewer replied, allow me to return the compliment. And he did. McElliot looked at him with shining eyes. That wouldn't be half as bad as I used to think it would be. In fact, it was twice as good. Then she sighed. But I still have a problem. If we're going off to the mountains for a couple of days... Tell me, said McGrewer, the octopus is known to be innovative and adaptable. Problems are my meat and drink. Well, this one will have to be your drink, McElliot said. It's my milk. What, what'll we do with it? Otherwise, and I really should be milked twice a day for comfort. McGrewer turned sickly white. He could face the thought of a troll on its own ground, but the but goat's milk twice a day? He tried not to heave and wondered if he really needed to see the sea so badly after all. He heard McElliot sniffle and turn to her. She was looking very uncomfortable indeed. And I haven't been milked for two days now, she bleated miserably. McGrewer took pity on her. He picked up the bucket, emptied out the apples, coiled himself around her and said, I'll try my hand at it. 
McElliot snuggled up against him and said, You're much more comfortable than a stool. The milk came down in warm, sweet squirts and the bucket began to fill. Higher and higher the milk crept until the foam was tickling the grower's mouth. He licked his lips without thinking. They tasted warm and sweet. The bucket was almost overflowing. Quick, what shall I do, McGrewer said. He looked around. There was not another container in sight. The octopus is known to be innovative and adaptable, McElliot repeated dreamily. So have a swig, she said, kicking his left hind tentacle sharply with her right forefoot. McGrewer swigged obediently. He swigged again and again. That wasn't half as bad as I used to think it would be. In fact, it was twice as good. He licked his lips appreciatively. Let's go up the mountains tomorrow. He turned pink in anticipation. We'd better go tell Mrs. Dumpling I'm home and Captain Duff we're going, McElliot said primarily, as if butter wouldn't melt in, in her mouth, though it doesn't sound as if she's worried about me now, and it certainly doesn't sound as if he'll miss you tomorrow, she observed, as the sounds of laughter and talk which had been coming from the kitchen continued unabated. As they opened the door, Mrs. Dumpling was just reaching out for the teapot on the hot hob. I don't know that I really want to go to Russia, she was saying, but I wouldn't mind one of those samovars you were telling me about. Imagine, tea on tap all day long. She picked up her empty cup. Magrua put the bucket of milk down beside her. I wouldn't be wishing for a samovar full of tea that rots your guts, he said, when you've got a goat like McElliot with the best milk in Otago on tap, fresh twice a day. Mrs. Dumpling looked up. McElliot, she shrieked. What a fright you've given me. Mr. McGrewer, where did you find her? Thank you for bringing her home. And you've milked her too. How lovely. My pleasure, ma'am, McGrewer said, and his voice was as smooth as plum brandy. Contrary to its unfortunate reputation in the popular press, the octopus is friendly and cooperative as well as diligent. And you talk as well, Mrs. Dumpling's mouth was so wide open. McGrewer was tempted to stuff her ball of knitting wool into it to see what would happen, see what would happen next. He restrained himself, however, and said firmly more to himself than others. Some octopuses have been described as pranksters, but one prankster in a family is enough. He smiled indulgently at McElliot. You never told me he could talk, Mrs. Dumpling said to Captain Duff. And where did he learn to milk? I'd like to know. Well, my dear Eva, I wish I could take you to the tropical paradise, that little island in the South Seas where the lagoons are as blue as mermaids' eyes, the palms sigh like lovesick sailors, and the coconut milk is like the elixir of life. Thank you, Herbert, but I'm not much one for gadding about. And besides, who'd look after the sheep while I was away? You just tell me about it and I'll be happy. And so it came to pass as that as McElliot... Mm. Uh, Mc, sorry, and McGrewer tramped off up the mountainside for a view of the sea, Captain Duff sat in the sun with his telescope to his right eyes and his back to the wall of his wee bark, telling the story of his first encounter with the octopus to Mrs. Dumpling. And as she spun her wool and he spun his tail, he would break off from time to time as he caught a glimpse of them among the crags and slap his knees with a shout of laughter that made the mountains ring. My McGrewer and his skipping samovar, every troll in Otago will be off to Norway tomorrow. Then as they finally disappeared over the highest peak, he added, and I can't think of anything more useful than that, unless it is an apple pie with a piece of goat's milk cheese. The end.